Hello and welcome uh, to um, our grade 11 course. Uh, basically today we're going to focus on three basic ideas, uh, circular motion, gravitational force, and planetary motion. Uh, in the first part, circular motion, uh, we need to be able to define the circular motion in the uniform circular motion. We need to be able to uh, calculating the centri uh, centripetal force and centripetal acceleration. In the second part, which is related to the gravitational force, we need to be able to calculating gravitational force using uh, Newton's law of uh, gravitation. And finally, we need to calculate the, op the orbital speed and orbital time period using uh, Kepler's and Newton's laws. So uh, at the very beginning, we need to define the meaning of the circular motion. And the circular motion is defined as any object that moves in a circular path. And as you can see that this mass is moving in a circular path, uh, making a circle like that. So uh, moving an, um, an object in a circular path, this is the definition of the circular motion. And as you can see, there are many physical quantities included in any circular motion. First of all, the velocity, and this is the velocity we call it VT, because as you can see, it's a tangent to the circle. Uh, that's why we call it tangential velocity, which is tangent to the circular path. The second uh, value is the mass, which is the mass of the object in kilograms. And you have two physical quantities um, directed towards the center. The first one is called the AC, which is the centripetal acceleration. And the second one, which is called FC, which is the centripetal force. So these are the physical quantities that you need to use in any circular motion. We need not to forget the radius as well, because the radius is the radius of the circular path, which is in meters. So we can mention the units here, besides the values, and uh, the mass is in kilograms, velocity is in meters per second, acceleration is in meters per second square, and the force is in newtons. So uh, these are the physical quantities that you need uh, in uh, calculating the physical quantities related to um, the uh, circular motion. So we can list them here. So first of all, you need the mass of the object, which is in kilograms. You need the velocity or tangential velocity. We can call it V or VT, which is in meters per second. You need the radius, which is in meters. You need the uh, AC, which is centripetal acceleration, which is in meters per second square. And you need the uh, 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 centripetal force, which is FC, which is in newtons. So these are the physical quantities included or involved in any circular motion. If uh, the velocity, um, for any velocity, we have a magnitude and direction. So uh, VT is having a magnitude and a direction. That's why uh, velocity is uh, a phys physical quantity that is uh, vector, vector quantity. So th if the magnitude, which is the value of the, the velocity is the same, it's not changing, this means that we are moving in a uniform circular motion. So the uniform circular motion is when you have a constant magnitude of velocity. So if the object is moving with the same velocity, this is considered uh, with the same magnitude of velocity, or we can say with the same speed, so the object is uh, called um, or uh, mentioned to be moving in uniform circular motion. So if there is a car that is moving um, in, a, in a circular path and its speed or the value is the same, let's say 60 meters per second, 60 meters per second, 60 meters per second. So this is what we call uniform circular motion. And here we say that it is constant uh, magnitude because the direction is always changing. So, so I can't say it's, it has a constant direction. Uh, but it has a constant, if it has a constant magnitude, so this means that the object is in uniform circular motion. 
then um, because the velocity is always changing its direction or the direction of the velocity is always or continuously changing so that we can call this the, that we have um, an acceleration and this acceleration is centripetal acceleration so the centripetal acceleration is the acceleration due to the change of direction um, and if you do remember that um, there are two main causes of acceleration it's uh, it could be um, the change of uh, the magnitude or the change of the direction of the velocity so you might have um, uh, if, if you have a change in magnitude so you'll be having an acceleration due to the change of the value or uh, due to the change of the direction so you'd be having another kind of acceleration uh, so, uh, due to the, the continuous change of the direction, you will be having something called the AC, and the AC is the uh, centripetal acceleration. Centripetal acceleration, which is AC, can be calculated by this formula, which is VT squared over R, or V squared over R. Uh, and um, uh, the unit is meters per second squared. And basically, V is the, is the tangential velocity, and R is the radius of the circular path. So this is the first value that you need to calculate in a circular motion. The second value is the force. And due to uh, the existence of acceleration, there is a force. And we concluded that from the second law of Newton. Newton's second law said that if there is an acceleration, so there should be um, a force. And the force can be calculated by mass times acceleration. So once the force is called an FC or a centripetal force, so the, the A also should be here a centripetal acceleration. So FC or centripetal acceleration is equal to the mass times the centripetal acceleration. So the FC is calculated by this formula. And this is uh, the same as uh, Newton's second law. So it is not uh, a new formula. The centripetal acceleration, uh, the centripetal force can be defined as the force that maintains the circular motion. So without this force, there will be no circular motion. There is a, a continuous force that should maintain the circular motion and this is the centripetal force. Uh, by um, um, substituting the value of AC, because we know that AC is equal to Vt squared over R, so we can say that FC, which is equal to M times AC, can be calculated by this formula as well, which is a M multiplied by Vt squared over R. So this is another formula. This is a direct substitution of the value of AC. And it is measured in Newtons. Also, you can um, play with the, with the formula by deriving the, the, the value of the VT. Uh, for any circular motion, uh, you have, this is VT and this is the radius here. Uh, we know that if uh, the velocity is equal to displacement over time. But the displacement, the displacement here is a circular displacement. So the length of this path is uh, uh, the circumference of the circular path. And we know that the circumference, uh, the circumference is 2 pi r divided by time. So we can say that Vt is equal to 2 pi r over t, which means we can substitute the value of 
the VT with 2 pi r over t and we are going to do this later uh, when we derive the equations of Kepler. So now we uh, defined the circular motion and uh, we let's go to the the objectives now we defined the meaning of the circular motion and the meaning of the uniform circular motion and we calculated the centripetal acceleration and the centripetal force now let's go to the other item which is the third item here which is gravitational force and once we mention something related to force we need to remember our uh, genius scientist Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, and his Apple story. Although this this story uh, is not that uh, true, but again, uh, Isaac Newton uh, was uh, thinking of uh, falling objects, and if everything is falling towards the Earth, uh, like the apple, like anything um, that is uh, dropped. Uh, or thrown upward it shall come back to the earth he thought why the moon is not falling why it is not uh, going in a free fall to the moon uh, to the earth and he had a genius uh, thought uh, uh, and a genius uh, experiment we we call it um, thought experiment and he said that in, in this experiment he said that suppose that this is the earth and I have a cannon here and the cannon is uh, giving a certain um, a bullet which is here the bullet basically will take a certain curve and then it will fall down so Isaac Newton said that if the cannon uh, dropped or throw uh, through a, a ball which is the bullet it will take a certain curve and finally it will fall down with more speed it will increase the curve but eventually it will fall down at the end but in his thought experiment Isaac Newton imagined that there is a specific velocity for the bullet that makes it go around going around the earth in a circular path and never falls down uh, so this is a continuous circular motion and he said in order for the this bullet uh, to do that uh, the cannonball must have uh, a specific force that is equal exactly to the gravitational force so he said that well in order to do that we should have a gravitational force that is exactly equal to the centripetal force and the centripetal force um, is the, the the force that keeps the object moving in a circle so this was the final conclusion for Isaac Newton and he said that the moon is in a continuous fall but the, this fall has a specific trait which is its centripetal force is equal to its gravitational force so it never uh, goes down to the earth it is going down to the earth but never um, fall, fall uh, it never falls down uh, into uh, the earth's surface so Isaac Newton uh, uh, calculated the FG and he said that if there are two masses let's have a new page if he has if there are two masses mass one and mass two let's say that uh, this mass smaller so those two masses are separated by a certain distance r he said that there is a gravitational force between them which is fg and this FG is directly proportioned to the masses M1 and M2 and this FG is inversely proportioned to the R square so the more the R the less the, the, the FG by combining them so he figured out that FG is proportioned to M1 times M2 divided by R square 
And in, in order to get rid of the proportion sign, we need to uh, uh, replace it with uh, a constant. So fg should be equal to g, which is a constant value, m1, m2 over r squared. Uh, so this was the final uh, uh, form of the gravitational force. It is equal to the two masses multiplied by the g, which is a constant, uh, divided by r squared. Uh, g basically is a constant. It is not this g, the small g. The small g is something else. g, which is the universal law uh, of gravitation constant or the gravitational constant, uh, which is 6.6 .6 multiplied by 10 to the power of, uh, I believe, negative 11 uh, Newton meter square uh, per kilogram square. So uh, this is the... Um, the uh, gravitational constant, uh, while g the small is something else, which is the free fall motion or the so the free fall acceleration, which is 9.8 meters per second square. So uh, uh, do not be confused between the two values. This is different from this. So this is the gravitational law of Isaac Newton, uh, which is if g is equal to m1 m2 over r square. So now we covered the third objective which is uh, related to calculating the gravitational force um, um, using the gravity, the universal law of gravitation uh, which is hypothesized by Isaac Newton. So the third thing that we need to cover well, is Kepler's laws um, and basically uh, Kepler um, uh, suggested three laws uh, and these three laws are um, controlling the planetary motion. The first one is uh, describing the shape of uh, the orbits. The second one uh, describing the relationship between the areas and the times uh, covered by the orbits uh, or the planets. And the third law is um, um, relating the radius of the orbit and the time period of the orbit. In his first law, Kepler mentioned that all of the, uh, the orbits are elliptical and the sun is in one of the focal points. The second law said that uh, the planets are uh, sweeping out uh, equal areas in equal time intervals. So A1 um, is equal to A2 and T1 is equal to T2. Which means that uh, when the planets uh, are coming closer to the sun, if this is the sun here, this big point, so the planets uh, they cover uh, more distance and when they are away from the sun they cover this area in the same time here so area one uh, took a uh, took t1 which is the time which would be equal to the area two or the second area and the time would be also the same so we conclude that if this huge area is covered in this time, uh, the second area also is covered in the same time, which means that the speed here is totally different from the speed, the, the speed in the other part. So the planets basically uh, become uh, faster when they come closer to the sun, and they, be, they become slower when they go away from the sun. Finally, uh, the third law, uh, is relating the the radius of the planet, the the orbits, and the time period. And he said that uh, t square is directly proportional to r cube. Uh, Kepler wasn't good in math, so after he hypothesized this law, the, his observations basically supported this law. But he couldn't prove it mathematically. 
uh, and it was the role of uh, our genius Isaac Newton. So Isaac Newton basically he concluded and proved that Kepler's third law is uh, correct. And let's do that here. So we mentioned that if in order for a planet or for the moon to move around the sun and uh, to move around the earth and not falling down on the ground so this means that the moon is in a continuous fallen uh, movement but the fg or the gravitational force is equal to fc and we know that the gravitational force is g m1 m2 over r squared one of the M's is for the planet and the other one is for the Sun or if you are talking about that the, the earth and the, the moon so one of them would be for the moon and the other one would be for the earth and we know that FC is equal to M V T square over R by crossing one of the R's with, with the one here and crossing the M with M which is for the planet because we are trying to measure the, 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 the speed of the planet so this is also the mass of the planet so cross it out you will find out that G M2 divided by R is equal to V T squared So, by substituting the value of V, if you do remember that, we mentioned this earlier, V is equal to 2 pi R over T. So, we can say that GM2 over R, which is this, would be equal to 2 pi R over T squared. So, G M2 over R is equal to 4, 2 square, pi square, R square, divided by T square. And then by cross multiplication here, you will find out that G M2 times T square is equal to 4 pi square R cubed. So, by solving for T, you will find out that uh, T square is equal to, divide by GM, here we divide it by GM, so it would be 4 pi square divided by GM multiplied by R cubed. And look at that. This is wonderful and genius as well. Because 4 pi squared divided by GM is a, is a constant. We know that the pi is a constant, it's 3.14. G is a constant, which is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power of negative 11. And the mass of the sun is constant. So the only values that are, the only variables here would be T squared and R, which means that T squared is directly proportion, or let's say that it is equal to constant times R cubed, which means that T squared is directly proportion with R cube. This is wonderful because this proves the third hypothesis for Kepler, which is T squared Z is directly proportional with R cube. And Isaac Newton proved it. Here we can change the T into T capital, no problem. It says capital T, no problem, or T small, whatever. Uh, so this is how Isaac Newton proved that the third law of Kepler is uh, correct. Using these formulas you can find uh, the orbital speeds and the orbital time period. So uh, basically you can find uh, the orbital speed which is V and you can find the T. Let's say that it is a capital T, no problem, or small t, it, it won't make any difference. Um, and we have found them already during our uh, calculations here because um, FC is equal to, um, or let's say FG is equal to FC, which means that G M1, M2, 
over r squared would be equal to vt squared over r cross the r with the r you will find out that uh, uh, vt squared is equal to g m1 uh, here we forgot the m so uh, this is the m of the planet itself cross the m as well you'll find out that g uh, um, uh, vt squared is equal to g m2 divided by r and this is the orbital speed orbital speed and this is very important because without this simple formula we cannot calculate the orbital speed of planets and satellites we are using this formula uh, in order to calculate the, the the speeds of the planetary object or the satellites you can change this formula uh, and we could uh, finally find the vt uh, you can change this formula into um, uh, v is equal to square root of g m over r but i don't prefer this because sometimes we need internal values like m or r so uh, sometimes this square root uh, confuses you so i prefer this using this formula but if we wanted vt using this formula don't forget to get the square value of the v um, finding the t you're going to use this same formula which is for the v which is vt squared over r uh, vt squared which is equal to g m over r but you're going to change the value of the vt by 2 pi r over t square so let's square them now which is uh, this would be 4 and this is a square this is square and this is square uh, is equal to g m over r and then you can cross multiply so you'll find out that um, uh, 4 pi square r cube because r times r is equal to g m to t square and then you can find the t square by 4 pi square r cube divided by g m g m so uh, this is how we calculate the uh, time or the orbital time this is the orbital period or orbital time and this is the orbital speed so now we concluded uh, the, uh, that the orbital um, uh, period is directly proportioned to the orbital period squared is uh, directly proportioned to the cubic value of r which is the third law of Kepler and we um, also derived the uh, orbital speed and orbital time period so by now we covered the three objectives for today we covered the circular motion and said definition of the uniform circular motion uh, and we calculated the centripetal acceleration and centripetal force and we uh, used uh, the gravitational or the universal law of gravitation and finally we calculated the orbital speed and the orbital period using Kepler's hypothesis and the gravitational law uh, of Newton so we can uh, make a final summary here for all of the formulas that you need so first of all you need uh, uh, the uh, AC which is um, VT squared over R and it is measured in meters per second square and you need FC which is centripetal force which is M times AC or you can say that it is equal to uh, 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 M times VT squared here square over r and it is measured in newtons and we mentioned that if g is equal to g m1 m2 over r square here and also it is measured in newtons and finally we measured the vt square or the orbital speed which was equal to uh, g m 
over r and the t square is equal to 4 pi 4 pi square 4 pi square r cubic r divided by gm and this is what we call the orbital speed orbital speed and this is what we call the orbital period and uh, two important uh, uh, notes here uh, this mass is the mass of the central object and this mass also is the mass of the central object so if you are for example uh, trying to uh, calculate the V of a satellite if this is the earth uh, uh, if this is the earth and you need to calculate the speed of uh, the satellite here so all what you need is uh, the distance which includes the radius of the earth and the height as well so this is the whole r that you need let's say that this is r of the earth or the radius of the earth and the mass that you're going to use to find the vt and to find the time period uh, you're going to use the mass of the object in the center because it is the one that is uh, affecting the uh, orbital motion in general so now we covered um, all of these items for today uh, i hope that it was beneficial for you please post your comments or questions uh, below this video. Thank you very much. This is Shadil Qassas, Head of Science Department, Charge American International School.